Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm so glad that you made it here today, okay? It's pretty foggy out there, at least it was when I came, so um, glad to see all of you safe and sound. I um, have just a number of announcements this morning. A couple of those came in um, just kind of at the last minute. So um, our first one that I want to share is actually not on the screen. It is a note from the Salem Lutheran Home uh, asking for donations for Christmas stocking stuffers. Um, so they suggest items such as socks, lotions, body spray, nail polish, PJs, candies, pops, snacks, books, games, or cards. I don't know if anybody is interested in um, providing some of these things for any of the residents at Salem Home, but I will be going there for um, Wednesday devotions, so if there's something that you would like me to bring along with me, I sure could do that. Um, so there's that if you want to participate in in uh, helping out the residents there. And then a note from our um, Sunday School program. We're having um, some practices here in the next couple of weeks, and the program itself will be on December 17th at 10.30, and so um, they're gonna be working on getting that all set together. The kids are just gonna be in regular clothes, so if there are kids that are here and haven't been to Sunday School today, um, there are opportunities to, to participate still, so, um, also, they're working on a little project to help some of the folks at New Visions. There's a six-year-old boy, Liam, um, who's looking for some items for his Christmas wish list. Uh, Pokemon cards, art stuff, coloring, and crayon supplies. And then Wyatt um, is a one-year-old boy. He's uh, probably just looking for some clothes and some little toys, like stuffed animals and um, fun little things like that. Um, so if you'd like to donate to the Sunday School program, so adopt a child, um, those are some options there. Um, if you don't want to, that's okay too. So, um, yeah, I think, I think I've covered most of that. And then, as you know, this Wednesday is our Evel Skeever Supper from 5 to 7, and probably most of you have already been contacted about that a number of times. So just keep that in, in mind, and if you've been asked to serve or help with something for Ebelskiever um, and you need to double check, you can talk with, uh, with Norma today and uh, get that button down. So we were still looking, I think, for some people maybe to help bus tables and things like that. So if you're able to do that, that would be appreciated. And a reminder about the December 10th. Community Christmas caroling and soup supper over at the Methodist Church. That will be... 5.30 to 6.30. So, I think I've covered pretty much most of the announcements. Um, are there any others that you want to share this morning? Okay. And then, as I said, our um, Sunday School Christmas program, December 17th. And uh, you are encouraged and invited to bring neighbors and friends and family members. So let us now turn to our Advent One worship service. We'll begin with our lighting of the Advent candle. <clears throat> the first candle that we light today is called the Prophet's Candle. In Hebrews 1, the author writes, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. The prophets spoke messages of repentance and destruction, of hope and future glory. But most importantly, the prophets foretold of the coming Messiah or the Christ of God. Both of these titles mean the Chosen One. The Chosen One of God was to come from the family of Jesse and would be a king in the lineage of Jesse's son David. The prophet's message calls us to return to be renewed in our relationship with God through our worship life putting him first in all things. So let us pray. As we light the first candle of our Advent wreath, the prophet's candle, we give thanks to you, O God. In obedience to your will, the prophets of old have shown us our need of a savior. They direct us with hopeful expectation to the manger 
and the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offering, heirs according to the promise. Are there children that want to come for the children's message? All right. <coughs> Just one. All right. Hi. That is beautiful. Did you make this? Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Tell me about it. It's raining. Okay. And so you have some clouds and some rain, and is this the grass? And here is the, the sunset. Oh, how beautiful. Thank you so much for giving this. Do I get to keep it? Oh, great. That's so wonderful. Thank you. I'll put that in my office. Very nice. Okay. Well, today I wanted to um, talk to you about something. Uh, have you noticed that we've changed the colors of our, our um, pyramids or our, the linens and things that are on our walls and stuff? Yeah. Why do you suppose, why do we suppose we've changed those? Because Christmas is coming up. You're right. It's because Christmas is coming up. And so um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about this changing of the colors and the changing of the seasons. Now, we know that um, Christmas is almost coming, and so we know that winter is also almost coming. So there's the seasons of the year that we know about. Which ones are those again? Do you remember? We have winter, then comes spring, and then what comes after spring? Summer, and then what comes after that? <laughs> Well, kind of winter. So usually we get the changing of the leaves first. Fall. Fall, right. So those are the four seasons of the regular year. But did you know that the church has seasons too? It does. And I'm going to show you and tell you about it. Okay. So right now, we're in the blue season, right? Okay, that's also the time that we're preparing for Christmas. So when it's the season the season of Advent, that's the season of waiting and watching for Jesus to come, it's blue. And after that, it comes to Christmas, and then it turns to white. And then after Christmas, we get season of Epiphany. And Epiphany is kind of like when God reveals himself in Jesus. So that's the season of growth. And usually when we have growth, we usually have green. So you can kind of think about that. Like you, you, you did your grass green because grass grows. Yeah, okay, so that's kind of the same idea. And then um, in the springtime before Easter comes, we have another church season, which is called Lent. And that's usually purple. We have like purple colors up here. Okay. And then Easter time is usually white or gold because our King Jesus has come into the world and he's holy and he's um, wonderful and it's a season of celebration of Jesus' resurrection. And then we have this whole long time where it's green again. And we just got done with that. So it was like, I don't know, 30 weeks or 20 some weeks of green, 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 green. Now, I like green, but sometimes I like it when it changes because that tells me something else. It tells me that something new is happening in church. So, today and the next four, sun, or the next three Sundays, we're going to be celebrating Jesus coming to earth as a baby. Now, are you going to be helping with your, your program, your Sunday school program? Yeah. Do you have a special part? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad. So we're going to be celebrating with you when you do your program, and we're going to be enjoying this time of waiting for the baby Jesus to get born. So I'm really excited about Advent and this blue color.
color time. All right, do you have any questions for me? No? Okay. Well, let's have a prayer. Jesus, we thank you so much for giving us these colors and symbols and different things that remind us of the different times um, of celebration throughout the year, um, throughout the church year especially, and for the season of Advent. And we are remembering uh, you coming to us in the form of a baby and uh, learning and growing into your manhood and, and becoming um, just a savior of the world and all the different changes that happen throughout the season in the church here, reminding us of all the changes <coughs> you went through in your life. And so we ask you, Lord, to be with us during this season of Advent, that you would help us to wait with eager expectation uh, for the redemption that you promised. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, you know what? Since you're the only one that came today, you can help yourself to a handful of these. <laughs> you're going to pick one for Granny? I think that would be really nice. A blue one. She's picking a blue one. Awesome. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Okay. Um, our sermon <clears throat> script, scripture today, excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. <clears> throat. Our sermon scripture is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the dust. Out of it, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife, wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. We're going to sing uh, the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Well, today we're starting a new sermon series, and it's called The Clothing of the King. And I hope that uh, this series will um, inspire you and encourage you. And uh, the first, the first um, sermon is called The Foretaste of Fashion, which is kind of an interesting topic for the first Sunday of Advent. Um, as I have written in our um, church newsletter, these, uh, this sermon series was actually written by a pastor by the name of Matt Popovitz, and so um, I'm sharing his, his message with you. So much of Christmas is about clothes. There are, uh, are ugly sweaters that you don at the holiday office party. Then there are coordinating outfits in the colors of the season displayed on the Christmas card that you have yet to order. And of course, the matching pajamas that mom has picked out for Christmas Eve. We spend a good deal of time in this time of year worrying about what we wear. And for good reason. The clothing of Christmas tells a story. It tells the world something of the excitement with which we celebrate, the meaning we seek to incorporate, and the memories we aim to make. The same could be said of the scriptures. The clothing tells a story. Sure, it's easy to overlook, but with as many other parts and pieces of God's word, these elements are not accidental. Indeed, these mentions of clothes, coverings, robes, and coats are rife with meaning. As we'll learn throughout the Advent season, the clothes point us forward to the King himself, Jesus Christ. It starts early. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are naked and afraid. There are moments in life in the Garden of Eden, and they have thrown it all away. The first of billions to buy Satan's tired lie that we are better off out from under God's love and leadership. Our ancestors are being read the riot act by God. Their sin would unleash a tidal wave of divine judgment upon humanity, the biggest of which was their expulsion from the garden itself. Not only would life for mankind forever be frustrating and filled with death, but they would no longer enjoy the presence of God. They and we would be left alone with our sin, made to reel from its effects apart from God, and feeling far from him whose love and care we need the most. Perhaps as you enter the holiday season, you're feeling the effects of Adam and Eve's fall from grace. If so, you're not alone. Despite the Christmas music that's been playing since before Thanksgiving, and the party invitations that are piling up, the primary emotion of many is grief. It could be that you're grieving the absence of a spouse. This is the first Christmas since they've been gone. Or it could be you're grieving the financial pressures that you feel as we turn the corner into the most expensive time of the year. You wish you had the means to do more, but for whatever reason, whether it's college debt, or a few bad decisions, or just a low-paying job, you just can't. For others, this season brings a keen awareness of relational strain. There's the sibling you're not speaking to, the kid who's disappointed you, the sister-in-law who has hurt you, and who will definitely not be sending a Christmas card. Or perhaps what you're grieving is simply a long list of regrets you carry. Regret and guilt over good things you've left undone and terrible things your past that you can't undo. As we enter Advent, where and how are you feeling the effects of Genesis chapter 3 in your own life? So there stands Adam and Eve, naked and awash in shame. Their nudity at first, when they were unblemished by sin, was of little account, at most a symbol of their purity and of their safety in God's care. But now corrupted by sin, sent out of their own, and vulnerable to the evils of a broken world as well as their own 
dysfunctional hearts. Their nakedness is a liability, not to mention a source of shame serving to remind them of their fall from grace. So what does God do? Does he send them off into the wilderness, cold, exposed, naked, afraid, and covering, covered in guilt? No. Genesis states it plainly. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Just let that sink in. God made clothes. God himself, with his own hands, fashioned a covering for both Adam and Eve. He was the first fashionista, the original couture designer. But he didn't use fig leaves as Adam had done, and he didn't whip up a few yards of fabric from some cotton in the garden. No, God worked in leather. He used skin. Though they and all humanity had been sentenced to death, the very first to die would not be Adam or Eve, but another. It would be the first time blood would be shed in God's good world, the first time a final breath would be taken, and the first time a once warm and vibrant body would grow cold, and it would all be done in service of mankind's sin and shame. A third party some truly innocent being. We're not told what kind of animal it was, only what it gave. It would lose its life, all so that guilty Adam and Eve could be sent out into an unknown, completely covered. What kind of God would cover over the sin and shame of a people who have rejected him? And what kind of God would not only cover their shame, but would do so at such an awful cost with his own two hands. Are you starting to see it? Is something coming into focus how this moment points us to Jesus? This is the first glimpse of the good news. Once Adam and Eve went on their way, their nakedness covered in new leather duds. God didn't give up on the business of making clothes and covering shame. This would be only the beginning. This would just be a glimpse. You see, in the very beginning, God had in mind your sin and shame. He had in mind the vulnerability we all feel, the pains and the problems associated with life in this sin-sick world that we're all feeling and fighting. And God would not be satisfied until we were all covered. And so he sent his son into the world, the one whose birth we eagerly await on this first week of Advent, to be our covering. And the clothing God the Father makes for all mankind in Christ is cut from the same bolt as those original garments. God again works in the flesh and blood. Through the loss of the most innocent lives, and through the shedding of blood, through the letting out of the last breath, and through the extinguishing of a perfect life, forgiveness was fashioned, enough for the whole world. In the life and death of Jesus Christ, there is now an outfit, custom, made, and crafted by God for you. And though we wander in dark and a difficult world in Christ, we are wrapped in the mercy of God, protected from the harshest elements, namely the ultimate effects of our sin. We are covered, and we will survive. I don't know exactly how you're feeling the vulnerability and the difficulty of our broken world this Advent season, but I do know that whatever it is, it is covered by Jesus Christ. You might think it too big, too awful, too evil, but it's not. When God makes a covering, he covers completely. And just in case you need a refresher on exactly what it was that God clothed you personally in Jesus' name, shame-covering, sin-destroying garments of grace, let this be a reminder to you. It was in your baptism. 
At that moment you encountered the water and the word, you were not only given a new name, child of God, a new life, eternal, but a new outfit. You were covered in grace and mercy, one for you in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This season, Jesus is clothing you with his perfect righteousness. It fits easily beneath an ugly Christmas sweater. It goes great with new flannel pajamas, and it will add a little extra something to your family photo. You are arrayed in something made just for you, something that has come at a great cost and that has been in the work since the very beginning. And it will fill your journey toward Christmas with peace. Rejoice, for you are wrapped in the oldest and most fabulous fashion of forgiveness. Amen. Our hymn song today is Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers. For the sake of 
of God's only Son, you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Your guilt has been covered, your shame removed, and you are clothed with Christ. Heirs to the promise of God, for he has come to you in grace. Clothed in the King, go in peace as you wait for his coming. Amen. Amen. Let us turn now to God in our prayers. <coughs> Gracious God, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. May your spirit kindle in us the spirit of readiness, that we may at all times and in all places be prepared for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of new beginnings, in these days of Advent, prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word in ever-powerful ways. By the power of your Holy Spirit, stir us to wait with joyful expectation for the coming of your Son, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of light and life, shine the light of your presence into our lives during these weeks of waning daylight. Fill the darkness of this world with your love, that all people will see your glory and know that you are the source of all good things, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy God, you give us signs of Jesus' return. Help us to see and discern those signs that we would be prepared for his coming and be ready for his arrival. Let us not be complacent in showing love to others. Let us not be slow to act when we see a neighbor in need. Let us not fall asleep spiritually, but continue to listen and watch for Jesus each day of our lives, serving him in faithfulness and devotion. Lord, in your mercy. God of comfort, your healing touch transcends time and space. Strengthen and console those who are anxious, grieving, lonely, ill, or discouraged in any way. We pray particularly this day for those on our prayer list, for Joe Martin Cross, Chris Bremen, Louise Brockhoff, Joni Eggers, James Eichenberger, Farrah Getter, Mal Percy, Michelle Jacobson, Laura Kemish, Mary Clint, Rachel Knopp, Kathleen Petit, Grace Polly, Paul Peterson, Tracy Shreves, Don Turk, Bob Toms, Catherine Toms, Bob Yonke, for Holly and Karan. Shine the light of your presence into their lives through the compassion which your people share with them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All these things we ask, Lord to grant according to your good and gracious will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I just want to remind you briefly about our offering plates there at the entrance of our sanctuary, if you would like to leave a gift for our ministry and our mission. Um, you can also do that through our website, that's at United Lutheran. Um, shellweek.org and uh, if you just go to the giving tab at the top of the page you can find uh, the links to get you set up there for the offering. So let us pray. Well God we give you thanks for all the good gifts that you have given to us, ourselves, our time, our possessions. Signs of your gracious and good love. We pray Lord that you would use these gifts according to your will and that for all, all people in need everywhere. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Together we pray the prayer our Lord Jesus once taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to this table of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Our communion today is um, here at the altar railing. And uh, if you would just please note that the grape juice is in the center of the tray, and the wine is on the outer edges of the tray. Come to the table and be fed by our God.
abundance with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, Lord of All Hopefulness.